to welcome you all to the Litchfield Historical Society. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm the director here, and thank you for joining us today for Talking Women, a conversation about women in the Western Reserve. As I mentioned, we have an audience here in the room, all of you all, as well as a virtual audience with us today as well. And that was so we could better reach our audience across both Connecticut and Ohio. So with that, a couple of things to know. Um, you'll see over here on the screen, we'll have slides. Sean is at our command center for any of you on Zoom. If you wanna use that um, chat function to drop any questions there, Sean will be monitoring that. Also for those in our real room, know that that means we have a hot mic in here with us. So if you have an urge to share something really exciting with the person sitting next to you, just know that that mic is pretty sensitive. So it might pick you up. Um, and then our virtual audience might have a hard time hearing. So try to save those questions and enthusiasm for the end. Um, so this is our second lecture. In our lecture series, Migration and Removal, Documenting the Historically Underrepresented Voices of Westward Expansion. And this is our second series, really diving into the history of the Western Reserve. For those of you who, who have not seen our exhibition, To Come to a Land of Milk and Honey, essentially when that exhibit was developed, we knew right away we were going to need two full years of lecture series to even scratch the surface of the really rich stories that were uncovered during that research. Stories of women, stories of migrants, stories of African Americans, indigenous peoples. Really, it is just quite the story. And I encourage you that if you have not seen the exhibition yet, you are welcome to pop in there today or to come back and check it out when we've opened for our exhibition season starting April 27th. So, that's most of what I have to say. I do want to give a special thank you out to the family of Don Mayer, who underwrote this lecture series and made this available to all of you. It allowed us to keep this as a free admission series so that we could keep that barrier very low. We do, of course, encourage donations. They are welcome. We have a donation box outside the door after you leave today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the people you really want to hear from today. Um, these are our wonderful staff. We have Sean over here. Give us a wave, Sean. Hey, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> and then kind of highlighted today in this conversation, exploring the histories of women that was really kind of uncovered, not necessarily hidden, but more bring, brought to light during the research and rediscovered and re-looked at are Alex Dubois, our curator, Kate Zulo, our head of education, and Linda Hawking, our archivist. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys to do the good stuff. All right. Well, I'm going to start us off because this program is very different from every other lecture in our lecture series, um, mostly because we wanted to give you a little bit behind the scenes of how a how the research goes when looking at something like the stories of women who migrated. Um, now, all of our exhibits here at the Historical Society require a huge deal of collaboration. And oftentimes we find ourselves sitting around the table, having these really fantastic conversations about the research that Linda and Alex are discovering. And at one point we thought, you know, I think other people would want to hear this conversation. <laughs> um, and, a few things that having a conversation allows us to do is first, it allows us to, um, to give you sort of a behind the scenes of the conversations that we are having when we design these exhibits. And also it allows us to share with you some of these primary sources and some of the research that we do in a really different way. Because one thing you'll notice today is a lot of these stories are, um, they're almost fragments of a story that can be put on the wall, right? That, when we look at these sources, we are engaging with them and we are becoming curious and we're researching them. But a lot of times we find ourselves with more questions than we have answers. So having a conversation allows us to sort of poke at some of those questions um, and explore the areas that we can answer and also explore the areas that we can't answer. Um, so because this is a conversation, and because this is very different from the type of lectures we usually give, this is a little bit of an experiment today. 
I have to say, Alex and Linda are most definitely um, kind of humoring me um, because I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, but, uh, you know, bear with us as we sort of um, play around with this format. And we're going to keep things pretty casual um, in sort of the vein of a conversation. Um, but of course, we do need to have a little background based information so that we're all sort of on the same page when we start this conversation. So Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you just to give us that baseline of what we're talking about today. Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. So once Sean tells me we've we're good. All right. So hopefully you are all seeing and you are all seeing a beautiful map on the screen right now. Um, if you've seen any of our lectures or you've come to the exhibit or you talk to me at all, you know what this map is. And um, I'm going to keep myself very brief because I could talk about this map for the whole afternoon and never ever get to the point of why we're all here. Um, <laughs> so this is a map that was done by Abel Buell. It's called the New and Improved Map of America, 1784-1785. Um, and what we use this map to show is what happened when the former colonies drew a map of what America would look like all the way to the Mississippi. And you can see that multiple of the colonies now states, their borders stretch way west. And what this is the result of is a, a number of royal charters given to these former colonies defined their western border with uh, a body of water, the South Sea, which we know is the Pacific Ocean. So mariners, geographers knew that there was some body of mass between the colonies and the ocean. They just didn't know how much land was there. So they effectively said to the colonies, some of the colonies, you can take all the land until you hit a body of water. Um, so from places like North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia especially, this is, in theory, their state borders are huge portions of the country that we know today. Huge, huge amounts of land belong to those states. Connecticut had a smaller amount of land, but it did have the same sort of charter. So if you take the modern uh, northern southern borders of Connecticut, those lines, and you just stretch them all the way to the ocean, that's what Connecticut, in theory, looked like at a point um, after the American Revolution. So I don't have a list in front of me, but there's a number of big, prominent cities that would today be cities within Connecticut if this was how things shaped up. Um, but obviously, if you imagine a, a new country where Virginia owns half of the land, it's probably not going to be a very uh, beneficial, peaceful union. Um, the states gave most of that western land claim to the American government, knowing that the government would use it to admit new states to the union. But Connecticut, um, for whatever reason, decided to not give everything back to the American government. So they kept one little piece of land right along the Pennsylvania border, south of Lake Erie, for its continued use and settlement. So the Western Reserve is literally the piece of land in the West that Connecticut reserved, Western Reserve. So that is what our exhibit looks at, is the sort of history of that, but also really the lived experience of the people who are part of the story. And that's what we're going to talk about today quite a bit. Um, so we move on to the next slide. And just so you have some context, because some of our conversations, some of the um, individuals we'll meet today, we're going to talk about their journey. And I want you to have some context for what that looked like. So this map shows two routes that people took from Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, essentially from New England, um, to the Western Reserve. The northern route, which is shown here in blue, and this is the uh, stops made by Moses Warren Jr., a surveyor in 1797. Um, that is what we call the northern route, goes through New York, follows a lot of rivers, bodies of water, gets to the shore of Lake Erie, and then can utilize traveling along Lake Erie to get to the Western Reserve. Um, it was quite popular in winter, especially because you could use frozen water to travel, sleigh sleds, things of that nature. The red line is the southern route, which goes through um, New Jersey, New York, and then across Pennsylvania. Um, the good news is this is an area that has Settlements already present, towns, things like taverns, um, some rural roads are in better shape. It's a little bit easier traveling until you hit that ridge looking thing in Pennsylvania, which is a mountain range. So then you have to cross the mountain. But once you get over the mountain, you are effectively almost in the Western Reserve. So it's almost like you get over the mountain and your finish line is in sight. Uh, so we know that people that we're talking about today took both of these routes going west. A lot of people chose them based on the time of the year, uh, the size of their party, um, and especially once we get into later, Things like the Erie Canal and other things help to make certain routes more, um, more applicable. But hopefully that gives you some sense of what people, um, that like the ones we're going to talk about today, how they actually, what they went through to get to the Western Reserve. Um, and we'll talk about a number of those experiences. All right. So let's meet some of the people that we're going to be focusing our conversations on today. Um, 
the first woman uh, that we'll talk about, her name was Hannah Huntington. And here's what you need to know about her. First, she was born in 1770 in Norwich, Connecticut. In 1791, she marries a man named Samuel Huntington. And they migrate to Ohio in 1801. So we know that she is about 30 years old when she's migrating um, to Ohio. She's going to head out there with her husband. She's going to bring with her her six children, all under the age of seven, which let's, we'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, she's also going out there with, um, with household, household staff. She's bringing a young woman named Patty um, and a man named George. And she is also bringing with her her also 30-year-old unmarried best friend named Margaret. Um, now, they are going to be settling in the Cleveland area. So that's where she's going to be located. Um, and the other thing to know about Hannah is that um, she comes from a relatively wealthy family. Um, her husband is going to be a political a politician and he's going to be important. So remember that when we're looking at the story of Hannah, that she is definitely from one of the more um, privileged women who are headed out into the Western Reserve. Um, the other thing to know about her is why we have all of these fantastic letters. Um, and it's because her husband, once they get out there, uh, he's going to be traveling quite a bit and she is going to be writing him letters. And, uh, uh, you know, when his, when his papers are preserved, her letters are in that collection of papers. So that's why we know what we do about Hannah and her experiences. So the next um, person we're going to talk about is Nancy. And unfortunately, we have a lot less information about her. Um, Nancy was an enslaved woman, and she was born in Litchfield in 1781. And in 1802, she migrated to Ohio with Elijah Wadsworth and his family. Uh, he was one of the uh, early settlers and uh, investors in the Western Reserve, and he took his family to Canfield. We don't know whether she went willingly or whether she had no choice in the migration. Um, her son, Prince, was 20 months old at the time, and we know that she had another son born in 1803, um, but we don't know who is the father of either child, um, whether that person is also within this family or not. Um, and we know later on, um, we find out from Elijah Wadsworth Will that her, one of her sons, her older son, um, was given land by him on the condition um, that he served out his indenture until he was 21 years of age. Um, we also know that in 1805, um, Nancy had to pay um, to register with the County of Crumble. And uh, it was recorded in February 11th of 1805. And this was because Ohio had instituted uh, what, what were known as black laws to try to keep uh, free African-Americans from moving to the state. And you had to register and pay a tax, which amounted to about $500. And uh, apparently that was because they felt you would incur debts and that would help offset whatever debts you might incur. Um, and uh, so she was apparently able to come up with that money and pay it. And that's also how we know about her other son. Um, but that's that's pretty much all we've been able to find out about Nancy. And then the third um, woman who we are going to talk about today was Louisa Maria Morris, um, who married John Stark Edwards and later married uh, Robert Montgomery after Edwards' death. She was born in 1787. Um, her parents were pretty prominent. Her father was a man named Lewis Morris, who served in the revolution as an aide to General Schuyler and General George Clinton. He was an early settler of Springfield, Vermont, and Louisa was born there. So she was sort of familiar with the idea of being in a territory that was relatively unsettled by uh, white people. And there's an early 20th century account of her father um, and his movement to Vermont and referred to him as pioneering with 40 slaves. 
Um, there is some dispute as to whether the what the status of the people in his household was because of Vermont's laws surrounding slavery, um, but he was also one of the Vermont ratifiers of the Constitution. Um, one of the interesting things we know about Louisa is that her mother, who was uh, Mary Polly Dwight, she was the daughter of Mary Edwards and Timothy Dwight. Um, so this made uh, her the granddaughter of Jonathan Edwards. So Louisa also had this very religious background. Um, her mother did not enjoy being in the wilds of Vermont. Um, and some accounts say that the couple separated and some accounts say that he abandoned her. Um, in any case, they, they split and they each married someone else. Um, we can't find very much information about what happened to her mother, only that she was then raised by her father in Vermont and her grandmother, her maternal grandmother actually in Massachusetts. Um, she moved to Ohio in 1807. Um, John Stark Edwards was actually the first cousin of her mother, so he was her first cousin once removed and also very connected to the Edwards family. So the, the fourth individual we'll meet today is named Margaret Van Horn Dwight, um, one of the first women that we actually came across doing research because her journal, which is what we're going to talk about, is widely published. And you can find a copy, a copy of it in this book. It's uh, published on its own. You can probably find one on your a PDF right now if you Google it. So she's one of the women whose story was immediately accessible to us, and she's one of the places we started. Um, so Margaret was born in 1790. She makes the journey west in 1810, so she's 20 years old. Um, very quickly after getting to Ohio, she marries a man named William Bell in 1811. Um, she travels first to Warren, and you'll learn why in a little bit, but if you heard Linda say the Dwight name and me say the Dwight name, you can probably understand why they were settling in the same place. Um, and what we know about Margaret is that she's the niece of Timothy Dwight, the president of Yale. So again, really a connected, religious, well-known, fairly wealthy family in Connecticut. Uh, her father dies when she's six years old. We know her mother remarries, and at that time she chooses to live in the household of her grandmother, who then also dies, and then she lives in New Haven. So she, for whatever reason, does not want to live with her mother and her stepfather. Um, and when the rest of her family is sort of no longer there, she makes the decision to go west. Um, she never explicitly tells us why, but we can talk, we can sort of extrapolate by what she's saying, some reasons we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so she is going west, as we said, possibly, likely, because she, her cousins are there. So surprise ruined. Uh, Louisa and John Stark Edwards are her cousins. So she's moving to go to their household to uh, be with them, which if you understand all the different perspectives of people going west, having someone you can rely upon in the reserve is a huge impetus for you to leave. Um, her travel companions are a deacon um, who just gives us the last name Wolcott. His wife and their daughter, whose name is Susan, she describes Susan as a very pleasant companion, but has numerous complaints about the person she called the deacon, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then the last person we're gonna meet is a, a young girl named Emily Nash. So if you're looking at the slide, you'll see that Emily is the only one who's not migrating from Connecticut. So we actually just sort of claimed her because she had the great story, but she's coming from Massachusetts. Um, but for us, she's also the youngest person we're gonna talk about. She makes the journey at the age of six. So she's not um, married, she doesn't have a, her own family. She's a young child who's make, making that uh, journey west. She's also the only one who migrated during the War of 1812, right, literally during the War of 1812. So she is deciding, the family's deciding to move west into an area that effectively was the front lines of the War of 1812. Um, and this is obviously going to color her experience when she gets there and the journey, but also um, if you want to get into the mindset of her as a, as a young girl, what the family is thinking about their new home and some of the anxiety they might have, the trepidation, um, how she might have been feeling. Uh, she's also the only one whose self-created documentary record, that is to say, things she wrote herself, stretches well into the 19th century. So she kept a diary from when she started this journey to 1888. So we have a huge amount of her life recorded that she uh, wrote down for us from 1812 to 1888. So she leaves with her parents, four siblings and one cousin. Um, and they are a sort of this, this narrative is a little bit different than Hannah's and Louisa's in that they are a family that decided that the prospects in Ohio were better than what they had in Massachusetts. So they quite literally sell their land in Massachusetts for different plots in Ohio and they're going to see 
um, if they can make a new life there. So they're we're just sort of guessing because we don't have all the information, but I would assume Emily is from a family that's less wealthy than the other narratives we might talk about, um, has less prospects here in town in, in New England, maybe less of a family connection. Um, so her reasoning, her experiences will be a bit different. Yeah, and let's let's talk a little bit about those decisions and those um, the reasoning for leaving. Um, all right, so the first thing we want to tackle is deciding to leave, deciding to migrate to Ohio. Um, we'll start you off with this little quote from Hannah. She says in one of her letters, I hope you will find a little spot that you will like and have everything in readiness for my removal next summer. Um, and I love this quote. It does definitely seem quite optimistic for Hannah. Um, however, also in her letters, she talks um, about her, I wouldn't say reluctance to leave, but maybe um, definitely expressing quite a bit of sadness about leaving, about disappointment for you know what she's going to be leaving behind. And I do want to talk about you guys now. I think that Margaret Van Horn Dwight, which talked, we've discussed at length about her decision to leave. Mm -hmm. So what do we know about what is influencing Margaret's decision to leave Connecticut? Yeah, so she she's writing a journal. So the journal that she's writing is actually being sent home to her young cousin. And someone I read said that it was a promise she kept to her young cousin that she'd write her journal so she knew what the process was like, sort of like, a, I'll write, I'll tell you everything I'm seeing on my journey to Ohio. And she mailed it back. Does her cousin ever migrate? No, no. not my much. Okay. So, so, that's, 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 okay. so the reason why the, what she's writing to us is effectively what she wants her cousin to know. Okay. Um, and she doesn't, unfortunately, explicitly state, I am going to Ohio for this reason, right. which would be great and make our jobs really easy. Um, <laughs> but we know that her family, you know, she'd lost members of her family, the one, the household she was living in, in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Right. We know that she was an unmarried woman at the time she made the journey at the age yeah. of 20. Um, and we know that she has family in Ohio, which is okay. a big factor. If, if you were going somewhere unknown, you so might be would feel it, better if you yeah. had a house to live in. Would it be fair to say that her home life in Connecticut is somewhat unstable, unreliable? Like that she's kind of bouncing between these different relatives she's living with? I think it's a it's a fair assumption based on her where she decided to live and that when like you know her grandmother died she didn't go back to her mother's house she went to a different household of a cousin right so um, you know we don't know but we can sort of guess that she might have preferred the concept of a new life in the west with her other cousins she's just, trying to find a home yeah. right like yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean there's also so louisa the reason we know what we know about her is that her granddaughter published a book called a pioneer homemaker a sketch in the life of louisa maria montgomery in 1903. So some of what's in there is probably conjecture. Um, some of it's quotes from letters, but we don't know whatever happened to those letters, whether they're still in the family. Um, but in that book, they did say that Louisa asked her, asked Margaret to come be with her in Ohio because she was often alone because John Stark Edwards was a lawyer and he had a lot of um, responsibilities in the county because there weren't that many lawyers there and he traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we'll definitely talk at length about being alone. <laughs> right. So, you know, um, that that might have been a pull, like at least this person wants me there. Yeah. And she also, you hey. know, what were her prospects in Connecticut? We don't know if she might have had someone there. She, I mean, if she was interested in marriage, if she was interested in teaching, yeah. like we don't, we don't really know because yeah. she doesn't tell us. So yeah, she, um, getting to the, the connection between her and Louisa, um, she does have a great quote in her journal, which is a cousin in this country, referring to Ohio, is not to be slighted, I assure you. I would give more for one in this country than 20 in old Connecticut. Ooh. So Ooh. it's a great quote that tells you a little bit about, um, you know, the fact that having that family support structure in Ohio is so important. Yeah. Of migrating there. Um, and she says, cousin Louisa was very happy to see me as I could wish. And I think I should be very happy and contented. So. If you read her journal, most of it is going to be her thinking the world is ending and it's terrible. But then when she gets to the minute she sees her cousin in Ohio and uh, John comes to collect her and bring her home and she meets Louisa, she's very happy. She seems to have. Well, yeah, she's decision. back with her people. Yeah. She's back with her family. And I don't think we said this, but um, Louisa and um, 
Margaret, their grandmother, Margaret Van, no, no. Um, Mary Edwards, yeah. Mary Edwards was their common grandmother. So she raised both of them. So they were together as children, right. um, almost as siblings. Mm -hmm. So then let's talk about people who we don't know if they had the choice to go, and that would be Nancy, right? So what, right, um, what different, stories could there be about her heading west? I mean, I don't know. It's all speculation, right? Because um, what we know, we know from the probate records and um, the registration records in Ohio and the Litchfield records, which record the birth of her first son. Um, the probate record, or I'm sorry, the um, the record in Ohio where she registered gives her birth date as 1781, and the Litchfield record um, says her son was born in 1801. And we do know um, because of uh, the Wadsworth family that she went there in 1802. But we tried to, I mean, I spent a long time with Find a Grave and um, Family Search right. and- Because um, we never, we never have Nancy's last find name. Aid. Right. And no, we don't have her net last name. Right. Um, we don't have a last name for her son. Um, they call her in this record, Nancy Negro, but um, you know, she may well have dropped that if she ever actually used it. Right. Um, no cemetery records, no church records. We found nothing to indicate if she died there, if she was right. buried there. So what do we know if her son's married? Do we know what her relationship to Elijah Wadsworth is at the time of her migration? Is she, so we know that she's at, at one point oh, enslaved by him here in Lynchfield. Right. But we do we know if she is enslaved with him when they migrate or is that just I mean presumably because she was not born late enough to fall under the gradual emancipation laws right and her son um was listed so they had to register children born to enslaved women after 1784 so her son is listed in the vital records okay yeah and that's an so, one. right right so he was her son was born so, enslaved so, um, but in Ohio, way. in Ohio, um, there was no slavery. So by going there, oh, she theoretically is free. Right. But yeah, she's traveling two years before Ohio has an statehood. So right. Right. it's sort of a gray period where it seems like Ohio will be admitted as a free state, um, but it's on the border with a slaveholding state. And there is a lot of movement of people across that border. So um, right. it's possible when she when she left, it was a different prospect than after Ohio was made a state. It's just something we have to speculate on. And I just have to think, like, what really are her options if Elijah Wadsworth is migrating? Like, like it, you know, what? I mean, I don't know. What would have happened right. if she refused Like, what if walk? she refused I mean, Yeah, exactly. Because very likely she would not have been a person who was allowed, like, a seat in a carriage or something. Right. She was probably walking with her 20 month old son. I just have to keep repeating that because it just boggles my mind. So walking to Ohio, that child that young with yes. a 20 month old walking with them. Right. Yeah, I mean, like a three mile hike with I know. my niece and nephews. <laughs> How much money would they need to travel? They had to get food somewhere? Did they bring that with them? That, that is a great point. Well, actually, let's let's talk about the journey because I think um, again, Margaret Van Horn Dwight, <laughs> she gives the most detail. She gives yeah. the most detail, and I think it's really interesting what sort of that that travel is like. Yeah. So Margaret will talk about mostly in the section about journey because her her documentary record is of the journey. Um, and Margaret obviously comes from a family that would have had money but she's traveling with a different family that she often describes as being um, cheap. So <laughs> on the cheapest way. Um, so uh, interesting, before we get too far, there's an interesting quote that I actually just, something I'd read but forgotten and then reread prepping for this, um, talks about a little bit about motivation, but also her experience. And she says that um, the country you passed through to we are beyond New York, I need not describe to you. So you know what New York looks like. Um, for I'm attended by a very unpleasant, though not uncommon companion, one to whom I have bowed in subjection ever since I left, cried, 
It has entirely prevented me from seeing the country lest I should be known, which is a really, really interesting quote yeah. that gets into what she's thinking as she's leaving Connecticut and traveling through New York. Um, and it's it's another one that she writes and doesn't then tell us why she's feeling this way. Why is she ashamed um, of um, migrating? Is she ashamed because she's leaving her home to go to New Connecticut? Is she right. ashamed or, you know, doesn't want people to know the company she's traveling in, or she, maybe she was traveling in the, the carriage, not to her uh -huh. status? Um, or is it is something with her being an unmarried woman making the journey? There's so many questions that I had after reading that that I right. wish Margaret would tell me. Um, what she's clearly not, even if she made this decision of her own accord mm -hmm. and she wants to go, she's clearly having reservations and there are things that are mm -hmm. preventing her from maybe wanting people wanting to know she's doing this, yeah. uh, which I found really interesting. And it's also really interesting. Yeah. Sorry. It's also really interesting that she would write that knowing this is going to be sent to her cousin. Yes. So oh. it's sort of a little bit of a. Yeah. She does instruct her cousin, let no one see this but your own family. Uh, which so we share it with you. Share with everyone, <laughs> which is the role, yeah, how it's, history works. And, you know, no one she didn't expect we'd all be sitting here reading it out loud to you, <laughs> exactly. pulling it apart. Yeah, but, but clearly she For she sure, wants yeah. her cousin and the family to know she's feeling this way, which okay. uh, you know yeah. it's great for us to be able to read that. But it just brings up a bunch of questions. Um, but yeah, so then the rest of her journal is about the journey, um, and it's really colorful. It's happy sometimes, sad sometimes, difficult many times. So if anyone does want to get into one of these primary sources, this is probably the most accessible one that you could find um, after you leave here. Uh, but she's traveling with a beacon. Is that slide up for me? All right, so you can read, I'll read the slide. So I will never go to New Connecticut with a deacon again, for we put up at every buy place in the country to save expense. It is very grating to my pride to go into a tavern and furnish and cook my own provision. So. The thing that I love about Margaret's journal is this is really, we're getting a firsthand account of someone who has one, used to one life in Connecticut and one society and one group of people and one way of living who on this journey is being forced to sort of come right in front of different ways of life and different groups of people, um, not always to her, um, you know, her amusement. Um, and this is one of the things that is sort of a constant throughout her thing. You'll see her arrive at a new place, new people, um, especially traveling through Pennsylvania. She's going to meet a lot of people who don't speak her language, who don't share her religion, um, who don't share her same customs. And that's sort of a, something that comes across all the time. Um, I think that was surprising to me reading that. Like, I didn't quite realize how big the cultural divide mm. was between people from the state of Connecticut and yep. people from Pennsylvania, that the German Dutch culture was seen as, I mean, they were seen as she, she talks about. Oh, she, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she doesn't say nice She's not nice, uh, um, nice. But she definitely, she does not see them as people that she has a, a common anything with. Yeah. Like she sees them as others. Um, Which is interesting because she ends up settling in Pennsylvania. Yeah, she comes back to Pennsylvania. Yeah, she comes back to the scene of the the oh, work. <laughs> She must have hated that. Yeah. I mean, but you can imagine that these all these reactions might not be what a Margaret ten years removed would have thought. I mean, this is this sure. is a bit of culture shock. It's a bit of you know leaving home, traveling with acquaintances that you don't really. She doesn't care for the deacon. Um, it's pretty clear. Cool. Uh, um, nothing worse than a traveling companion that you yeah that you're butting heads with. Yeah, and so we we really get a sense that. Um, I love it because in the story of the Western Reserve, you often hear someone say like they recreated New England and Ohio, which to some degree is true, but right. the process of actually getting there has it introduced Margaret to so many other types, so many other people, so many other situations yeah. that everything we have from her is really not about comfort. It's about discomfort and unfamiliarity mm -hmm. and, and feeling unsafe at times and rightfully so. So it's, a, it's really interesting because, you know, some of the accounts from once you get to Ohio, they're like, oh, yeah, this looks a little bit like New England, but with more trees. Um, I, I find this fascinating, but she feels unsafe sometimes. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Like what's um, what's going on there? And it, it, you know, this is what makes her her journal sometimes, you know, difficult to read, but it's it's she's reporting all of her experiences. Um, and there, so there are times where she's staying in a tavern with her companions, all their traveling companions and what he calls wagoners, which to my Estimation are people traveling to Ohio or back and forth carrying goods, usually largely single men. Um, can we um, like can we liken this to sort of like 
truck drivers today, like uh, people who are hauling yeah, goods back and possibly. forth. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, and she's staying at these small taverns in the same room as them. And there are times when, you know, there are specific incidents where she will feel, um, you know, she'll come down from, from the room and someone will come up to her and put their arms around her and say things to her that she doesn't want to hear. And, you know, it's traumatizing. I believe, it didn't someone awesome. climb into bed yes. with her? And there are multiple cases yeah, where she her means. companions, female companions are sleeping in a room and one of these men will come in and, and lay down with her is what she said. And I mean, that's incredibly terrifying. For incredibly, her. incredibly traumatizing and terrifying. You can understand how difficult it would have been, especially as the deacon was her the only male of her party, but not right. her family member, not her father, not someone that she could right. rely upon. She was often on her own. And the distance that she must have felt from from safety, right? When you're feeling in that unsafe place. Yeah, and, and it's the only tavern for 100 miles, you know, you can't. Right. Like you're not going, like, you're not, you you're can't not going leave. back to safety. Like, yeah. you're you're stuck feeling yeah. in that situation. And yeah. that must have felt. Yeah. And we don't know how much of it was her perception. Like, if, if you know, this is what these guys typically did. There's a bed with only one person in it. And there's no empty bed. Right. I'm going to get in find a place where there's a bed complete. Right. 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 But certainly I mean, not what she's used to. No. <laughs> I mean, all of this. So, yeah. So, like Linda said, some she formed certain opinions immediately, it would seem, upon finding people who don't speak her language and, and don't observe the Sabbath the way she would want them to when they right. drink too much. So, she makes certain opinions, and some of them we, you know, we today would say is our little bit cool. Um, so she says she's in a tavern and she there's 50 what she called Dutch men, which would be, you know, people of German descent living in Pennsylvania. Um, they've been here today to smoke, drink, swear, pitch sense, almost dance, laugh and talk and stare at us. It is dread almost dance. Almost dance. So not quite dance. I don't really know if it's not quite dance, but like get to the point of almost dance. That's the most I ever, that's the most I ever do. So I can I can understand that. Um, <laughs> What she says, it's dreadful to see so many people that you cannot speak to or understand. They are all high Dutch, but I hope not a true specimen of the Pennsylvanians generally. And this is really early on. So this is one of her first things she writes about them. Yeah. Um, so you get a sense that she's she is having the culture shock and she makes an opinion. Uh, but certainly that opinion doesn't invalidate the experiences that she has. Absolutely. And she yeah. has a traumatizing experience along the way. Um, we can certain. All right, but what what do we get when we get there? What's what's waiting for us in Ohio? What's what does Emily Nash have to say? So finding a new home. Uh, so this is Emily Nash. This is one of the quotes that we like. It's actually this quote was continued to be the reason why we chose the exhibit that we did. Um, so this is her having arrived in uh, at her family home. Um, which was prepared for her before she got there. So that's one thing she had to look forward to. When it was time to go to bed, there was no place to put the bed only on the ground. Mother said, takes the boards that were on the long sled, so they fashioned a little bit of bed. We all slept real well, probably because they were completely exhausted, um, and began to feel that we were at home in Ohio with wild beasts and wild men. So it's a bit of a contradiction there. She feels at home, but she's surrounded by wild things. Um, but we have to remember also Emily is the youngest of the people we are talking about today. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. She's really writing just whatever is coming to her mind about her experience. Um, yeah. But you do you do get a sense. She then goes on to say, like, we this is not a land of milk and honey, the name of our exhibit, which is why we chose it. It's a land of, you know, coyotes and snakes. And, uh, you know, there are native people living there that she's unfamiliar with. And she just, again, feels not quite safe in the right. winter, which is a... a point of all of the experiences. I mean, definitely we know from Hannah's early years, not feeling safe was, so So Hannah's in her letter, she's writing, she's writing to her husband. Um, and in every single letter, she is, I'm not saying begging him to come home, but like her, how much she misses him is, mm -hmm outstanding and i think in a lot of those letters you can you can hear a fear that she has because in those early years her family is sick All constantly i mean she starts every letter just listing the family members and how long they have not like are they well or healthy just how long they have been sick mm -hmm. and how many days they were in bed um and i mean in and she is also writing to, to Samuel, her husband, and fearing for his health and wellness as well. Um, that, oh my gosh, I mean, they're sick constantly. I don't know how you arrive someplace and set up house and take care of six kids. 
<laughs> well, I mean, she had health. She does have health. At least, uh, but they're also sick. Yeah. I mean, she she goes through days where she's like, um, you know, where where everybody is just. It's like a rotating thing of who's who's working and who's in bed. Who's, who's the most able to do the thing that needs to be done? Exactly. She's like today, the only person who could do anything was Margaret. Yeah. She did the farming and taking care of the children and everything. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's something that's interesting too that you see. So in addition to like this fear and the sickness, um, the women who are here have this degree of responsibility and in some ways autonomy that they didn't have or couldn't have had in Connecticut because their husbands are off doing whatever they're doing and they have no alternative but to be responsible for the farming, the bookkeeping, yeah. paying the bills. It's, um, a, it's a self-sufficiency. Right, and yeah, Louisa, um, and we found no documentation of this other than people saying it. Um, they said she read every book in her husband's law library and that the best written records in Trumbull County were in her hand. So she was also doing his law work. Yeah, that's amazing. Right. Oh, wow. Um, and Hannah was, I mean, Hannah was doing, we know Hannah did, mm -hmm. she negotiated contracts with tradespeople. Yep. Um, yep. She was paying the taxes for the family and finding money to do so. Um, oh, yeah. She was making decisions about where the children would go to school, who would board where, and all these things are sort of, in the letters, are not, not her asking, she's sort of, I've done this, and right. that would be proof. But it seems, at least in Hannah's case, as the letters go on, while loneliness is a constant and illness is a constant, she grows more proud of Absolutely. what she's doing as a woman in the Western Reserve and the new task that she's sort of done by necessity. And we're yeah, and we're, too. There's one letter I love, I absolutely love where she has, um, she's gotten the wheat in mm -hmm. for her family. And she's now describing how far ahead she is of all her neighbors and how much better she has done in getting the wheat in than everybody else in the neighborhood. And you hear that pride in her, in her voice, like that she's, and also probably a little, a little relief there, right? That her family is going to be fed, right? That they have wheat. Um, right. um, and Emily is even Emily's six when she gets there, but she's immediately right in the like the labor market, this Absolutely. informal economy that yeah. exists in communities where everybody does something that they do well in return for something else. So mm -hmm. um, Emily wrote, um, especially early on, that it was the women's work that kept the family afloat rather than her father's work. Um, she said all had, to do, all had to work or starve with hunger. Mother found all the work spinning and weaving that we could do. Um, and she says, if it, not, if it had not been for women's work, we could not get along because provisions are so expensive. So she's, her and her sisters and her mother are weaving and spending and literally trading their services for cows and right. food and everything that they need that they can't provide for themselves. And it and we it, also know that that cash is go, yeah. cash is nowhere to be found, right? Like the way, like this is a this is a, a an economy where there is no cash. Yes. Um, Hannah talks about that a lot. She's always like, taxes need to be paid, and I have no cash. I'm sending, you know, like. Um, I need cash, basically, <laughs> to pay the taxes, or you'll have to do it yourself. Um, yeah, so people like like Emily and her family are, are figuring out how to work an economy without cash. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Think they're doing. Um, yeah, so let's figure out what our next quote is. Experiences. Experiences. Yeah, I want to talk about these these experiences, because um, we're, we're going on, um, and we don't have too much time. So I want to talk about... Um, one thing that I, I really want to bring up because I think it's really important when talking about women, um, and especially in the Western Reserve, is these sort of two conflicting ideas. As one is these experiences of isolation and separation and how we see that coming across. And then sort of the flip side of that is also I want to talk about where we see these communities of women being created in the Western Reserve and how these women are um, are relying on each other and are creating, you know, systems of support, especially when they don't have, um, you know, especially Louisa and Hannah who do not have their husbands with them a lot of the time. So, where do you see in Louisa, um, like how she's dealing with her husband's, how she's feeling about her husband being gone so much? Well, I mean, she, we don't have her letters, 
Mm. So there's not maybe much that's like, I mean, <laughs> do yeah, to yeah, 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 I mean, so maybe I'll, can I talk about how Hannah feels? Yeah, I mean, and then I could say what yeah. she says when he dies. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that's pretty telling. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for Hannah, I can't stress this enough. She feels so lonely. Uh, and that's not me reading into things. That is her saying again and again and again what she feels on her separation from her husband and how isolated she feels and how um, much she wants him to come back. But also that, you know, she's saying, I want you here at home, but also I know, you know, I know you're important and you have work to do and you're out doing your work, but you know, this this pull between. But is it worth? Does she have to make she, it worth it? Yeah. Like you're giving up this time with your family. Is it worth it? Right. She says you're doing. Basically, she says you're doing this for your family. But what are you doing to your family by not being here? What do you like? What is your absence doing to your family? Even though I know all this work you're doing is for your family. Um, but then she also highly relatable now for a lot of people. Oh my gosh! Yeah, absolutely. And we're in families, especially with like working to working parents. Mm -hmm. um, but then she also says, you know, I won't be the one to 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 hold you back. Right. right. I will tie you to But I will make strength. you feel guilty about it. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you how sad and alone I feel. But I, so I think she's she keeps writing this because these letters, she is processing her feelings, right? You mm -hmm. I really think in her letters, you know, she's writing a lot of these letters knowing that they're going to be outdated by the time Samuel gets them. And she even writes a few times where like she gets a letter from him and obviously he hasn't received her last letters. If anything, she's just trying to, to process her feelings of loneliness. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it's not just loneliness, but it's like the inability to communicate because yes. the post the postal system is just being set up. Yeah. And it's very difficult to get letters to people. And as we know, there's really no other means of communication. Yeah. Unless, you know, someone you know travels from where you are to where they are. Yeah. And you often don't know where they are because the last. That's why she's so scared. Yeah. All the time. Kind of yeah. yeah. Right. So what does Louisa say when her husband dies? Um, so she said, is this up there, Sean? I can't tell. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So she says she was thinking of leaving this, this country um, because all of her family and John Stark Edwards' family was encouraging her to bring their children back east. Um, but she says that she's experienced the greatest happiness she ever has or probably shall have in this life there in Ohio. And her husband's body is there. And in the end, she doesn't return east. A year later, she remarries, and she and her new husband settle in the Youngstown area. And he's also a person who's away a lot. And um, she establishes a life there. And the local people refer to her as Aunt Louisa. And she does things like introduce carpets. She's supposedly <laughs> the first person who makes a carpet there. Um, but yeah, so it's like she feels, even though, and it's kind of a contrast to Hannah, even though her family is not there, she's sort of established this community around her. Right. And maybe her proximity to other people enabled her to do that in a way that right. Hannah's didn't. I mean, I will say that in Hannah's later letters, there is less pleading with Samuel to, to come home or to write more often. And I think some of that has to do with the fact that she is creating more of a community, right? We see the more names of women in her community that she's talking with um, and having relations, you know, but, um, like there's one particular one, Mrs. Walsworth, who is in a very similar situation to where her, where she is, where her, father, her husband is away a lot. And when Mrs. Walsworth is sick, so again, everybody's sick all the time. Um, it's Hannah who spends, you know, almost a week at their house taking care of her friends. Um, and they're also from Connecticut, right? They are. They're also, yeah, they're also from Connecticut. Yeah. Um, and Hannah gets visited by the Edwards at yes, some point. So. Right, yeah, we do, yeah. When we picked true. these narratives, we hadn't done the full yeah. genealogy. We didn't know any of them were connected. And then it right. turns out they're cousins and they visit each other and right. everyone knows each other. And it's actually a really nice. Yeah, story. with the exception of Nancy. The exception of Nancy um, and, and Emily, who's mm -hmm. come from a different place right. and a very different right. uh, 
experience. I, yeah, I mean, I think that says a little bit about the fact that the experiences we know the most of are three women from the same mm -hmm. privileged mm -hmm. class. I mean, like, I would love, I know we're getting running out of time, but I'm just going to shoehorn her in here. Um, like, I would love to know more about this young girl, Patty, that travels as a, as a domestic servant in Hannah's household when they head west. You know, she's one of those people that I have so many questions about, and she comes up, you know, here and there in Hannah's letters. Um, she gets the most page space when she um, gets pregnant um, for a second time by a different man from the first time. Um, and Hannah is trying to figure out, I mean, basically what what to do with the Patty situation. Um, now that, um, and you know, making making arrangements for, you know, what to do with Patty's. And then I think this is, is crazy there. She's basically talking with Mr. Walsworth, her friend's husband, about helping her place Patty's older son, William, so that Patty can have a second child and still work. Um, and she talks about Patty being humble, you know, that this will humble her. And I'm just like, oh man, like, yeah, the only, like, what is like, what is Patty's life yeah. here? Like what? It, it's sort of like, it's another instance where someone from a different background is only in the documentary record based on what someone, her employer, effectively yes. how has she, to say about. How, she is, how she's so impacting her yes. employer, right? It's not even about... You know, I mean, I mean, Patty does make it in there when she's also sick and not working. Um, but like again, it's uh, Patty's last name isn't given, and it, it's, it's, it's a, right. you know challenge with things like letters because Anna's writing list to Samuel. Samuel knows who Patty is. So Anna doesn't right. have to say Patty <laughs> born here, last name this. Yeah. Uh, so it makes it really hard for us to find out more but yeah. we much? try don't we oh, sure. <laughs> i was trying to okay. figure out like oh i know the last name of her second child's dad like can we figure this I out to find margaret no, no i know yeah even even her friend margaret cobb you know very little known and she's in a more of a position to maybe show up in the record but again it, it just leaves me with all these questions you know like how long does patty work for the huntington family like does she ever what happens to her son William? Does he get removed from the house? Does she have a relationship with him? Like, where? What is her Does relationship? Does the other man marry her? <sighs> she real, she's still I mean, in the letter. She's in the holding out hope that he will make an honest woman of her. Those are Hannah's words, not mine. Um, and not Patty. But, but, but and also, and and Hannah finds it very tough. She's like, and I doubt yeah, it. And then, <laughs> It was, it was just Tully, Mr. Tully, right? Yeah. And he said, I think at the end of Mr. Tully helping us out on the farm. And I'm like, okay, that's so another that also helps us better understand where the labor is coming from on this farmstead that they're hiring people. That you're but also, if we help. have their account books, oh, you know, we might be able to say, so it's, it's also like a lesson in yeah. how you can track people down when they left no record, or not that they left no record, but their record was not deemed worthy of saving right. in a right. lot of cases. Yeah. So actually, we're getting close to time. Yeah, so yeah, I, so I we're, figured, we're, since we're talking about record creation, yeah. um, Emily, our, our migrant from Massachusetts, is one of the most fascinating because she her journal, which is something like, what would I say, like 70 years, 70 years she keeps it, her journal becomes a place where she records the births and deaths of everyone in her community, like their names, their family, what they died from, how they were at the time that she found them. Um, and her records predate the official records kept by the county. So Emily's journal is the record, the record of the county of... Um, Wait, do we talk about why she's... So involved in yeah, so, so her father was a carpenter. Um, and a, I've heard something say he was a minister, but I can't be certain. Yeah. Um, but he is also justice of the peace. So he's involved in the funeral in terms of presiding over it and making the coffin. And Emily starts going with him as a very young girl to these funerals. Um, and even before that, she's going to the households where people are that are ill yeah. before they die. So death in this time happened in the house. Right. Um, and was often witnessed by members of the community who were brought in to help care for the sick and the dying. Right. So Emily, and, and there's, there's one really, there's one uh, scholar who's taken Emily's life as her whole academic 
her students, and it's wonderful. Um, but she said that Emily became what was called a, a layer of the dead. So someone that would attend the dying, um, record sort of how they were at the end of their life, uh, record what they died from, and then accompany the body to the funeral, sometimes creating or finding clothing for the body before it was put into the coffin. So Emily, through being you know involved in caring for other people in her community and traveling with her father, finds a profession in the West Reserve that no one else had and creates the only documentary evidence we have in terms of vital records of some people that will never know anything else about, which I find really fascinating. Yeah. Well, because every, you know, Hannah's letters are from a certain time period. People, our husband was away and only one sided. Yes. Margaret's is only about the journey, but Emily's is sort of the most complete record of, right. from a six year old to the time of her death and what her life was like. Yeah. So, so we know of her life later and you know, we know what she's like. And we have a photo of her. Oh, yes. How Which is on the, slide. the only one who uh, lived long enough to get to have her life. Do you know that there's a photo of, or there was at least a photo of Louisa, but we were not able to find it? It may still be in the family, we can hope. Maybe. But, um, so I do want to I do want to um, give time for questions, um, both here in the room and Sean is going to help us um, facilitate questions for those watching on Zoom. Um, do we want to just like in one word say what ha you know what happened to what them? happened to them? Sure, I can start with Hannah. Uh, um, her husband comes home in 1811, um, and then she dies in 1818. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Margaret married in 1811. She had 13 children. Um, and she died in 1834, so just shy of her 44th birthday. So another one who died fairly young. Yeah, I think um, um, I think Hannah, I think Hannah's 48. Yeah, so um, Emily died at the age of 81 in 1888. So she, again, I talk about what she did later in life, but she's the longest, the best record we have in terms of the length of it and how much information is that. Well, she also gets 80 years. Most women at this time, they're lucky with 48. <laughs> So um, Lisa almost got there. She got 79. Oh, hey, good um, and I think this is a good summation. Um, this is a, let's see, she wrote this in 1842. So 24 years actually before her death, she wrote to her half brother, James H. Morris. I'm an old woman being now in my 55th year and very plain, not in person and in dress only, but in manners and modes of thinking. I have been 35 years in this Western country, which was nearly a wilderness when I came to it and have been conversant with all classes and kind of people until I can now hardly be known to be a Yankee. I know I should seem very strange to any and all of you who are so recently from the East and with all so much younger. That is a perfect quote. Yes. And Nancy, um, you know, as we've said, I don't know what happened to her. We just and I hope someday maybe we will. Yeah. But and part of the reason we do programs like this is to share what we've learned with other people because this mm -hmm. topic will end with us. We yeah. hope it will continue, and we hope other people will want to find out more about these people yeah. and about other stories that we haven't found. So what do you guys want to know? Yeah. I mean, about the three of you, it was uh, very illuminating, and I can feature the amount of time that you folks must have spent to pull that in for a while. And uh, yeah. one other thing, any idea how many people emigrated in uh, Let's say a fifty-year period, late oh. eighteen hundred. Is that in that book, Alan? It might be in this book. So we know that the um, between seventeen ninety-five, when the people of the Connecticut Land Company bought the land, and about eighteen hundred or statehood, there was only about a thousand people living in the reserve. So it was super slow. Right. Immigration was super slow mm -hmm. um, for a number of reasons. And then when things like the War of eighteen twelve concluded, the Erie Canal was built. Then it really it's the eighteen twenties and thirties that it peaks. Um, <laughs> I don't have any numbers specifically on the top of my head, but they are, they would be in something like this. This book, if you want to just learn more, it's called The Peopling of New Connecticut. It's a sort of a compendium of primary sources with some essays. It's really accessible and it should talk about numbers and it does have census records and things like that. So, and you can likely get it at the library. Yeah. I think, do we have it in the shop, Sean? Not that one. Not that one, okay. Um, but yeah, so this one, this one I bought on ABE Books from the library for about three dollars, so um, you should be able to find it. But it's a great place to start, and it does cover everything. Um, but I would say most of the people that we talked about today are living in communities of 
50 or less, right. it seems. Um, and nearest neighbors miles yeah. away. And this is, I mean, so most yeah, people also- Yeah, so she doesn't get a visitor for yeah. three weeks. And she's living, they're all actually living pretty close to Cleveland, which is the, the capital of the first city, but Cleveland for a long, long time was not a city. It was, people call it a swampy marsh with lots yeah. of disease, so. Um, right. And we, we think the sickness was likely malaria. Yeah, likely. How did they actually travel? My wagon, my walking? Uh, yeah, it's on your status, yep. <laughs> right? How much money you have? How much money you have? But then when you're, I think when you're going over the mountains, there are times when they had to get rid of the wagon yeah, they, and just go on horseback or foot. Yeah, Margaret walked over the mountains much to her. Mm -hmm. so how long did it often take on average? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so you know Margaret I, came in the early October. Yeah, so it takes Margaret about two months probably to get there. Um, I know some of the surveyors and some of um, what happened a lot was- Men traveling alone yeah, on horseback. Yeah, men like, uh, you know, someone from Connecticut would go check on their lands in Ohio and then come back. And we know that they did that more quickly um, sometimes, so, you know. Yeah, we can see, what does Moses do there? I mean, Moses does, does about a, a, no, he does two months. Two, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, starting in early November, he gets home on Christmas day. So yeah. it's generally about two months, depending on weather conditions. Um, yeah. Some people didn't make it, so some people died, they drowned, they caught disease. Mm -hmm. um, some people, the ice. They just got ice. some people, you know what? Some people what? said this is good enough. Yeah, <laughs> Pennsylvania, my people, I'm gonna stay here. Um, so it all depends on different experiences. Everything obviously got quicker once the canals were open and the roads improved, and you found better support along the way. So, Sean, do we have any questions coming in online? Uh, you, you already answered one of them. Right. The, what you're getting sick of at the time. No. Uh, uh, yeah. Another question was uh, they're asking about what sources, if you have time to kind of keep working on this project, what sources would you go back to, like whether it, uh, we had done research in the reserve? So. Yeah, Alex, Linda, where, I mean, where would you go? For, I mean, Alex, I you took account books. Yeah. yeah. And you took a trip out to Ohio. I did, yeah. And I, I, I was ambitious on what I could look at. I had a, a little list of, I'll get there all of it. So then I got through like none of it. So um, the Western Reserve Historical Society has a phenomenal collection of material related to this story and you could spend a year there and not get it all yeah. um, i would like to but we have other exhibits <laughs> right. we need those the state library has the connecticut land company record yeah. um and i'd love to see those trumbull county records that they say are in louise's hand yeah. just, you know to see what i thought and yeah something we should get to do is go to like every town in the reserve will have a town hall that has vital statistics that we didn't have any chance to look at right, um, right. and every historical society and museum in every town has fabulous stuff that we just couldn't get to so i mean we could we could spend a decade i think on this um mm -hmm. yeah but, oh we got a couple more let's richard yeah. uh, so you mentioned they were moving miles apart so were they not sort of doing the Connecticut thing, which is living in the small communities and maybe with farm lots uh, on the periphery? Or were they really living, when you talk about yeah. up to 50 people, I would think yeah. they'd be in more of a village. So it's, it's, it's sort of a, it's a complicated answer that comes down to how the Connecticut Land Company gave out land. Uh, um, so the proprietors of the land company all bought into it, and they assign land by a lottery. So you, if you bought a certain amount, and squares. Yeah, so it's surveyed in squares. But if you bought a certain amount, you would get land everywhere. Lots all over the reserve, not connected at all. Um, and they did not have a concerted, unified effort to settle. Like they settle a town first and then move on to the next. They just wanted to sell land and make money. Okay. Um, I will say though that there are certain people in certain towns. Um, for instance, Elijah Boardman. Um, when he decided which town he wanted to settle and send his son to, he was trying to handpick the people who went there. Yeah, yeah. Because he wanted them to be all, you know, upstanding citizens. And and I, I don't know how many of the others did that. Oh, just, very, the Bourbons are exceptional. Yeah. The Bourbons challenged a little bit, but, you know, some of them were getting lands all over the reserve and then selling them to anyone as quickly as possible. Right. Um, we know the Connected Land Company went bankrupt, so it wasn't financially a success for them. Um, I think what would also bring it back to the woman is remembering that, you know, regardless of where they are, their their life was in the home. Yeah. So while their husbands may be able to go out and be visiting other towns and seeing other people, these women were at home. Yeah. And they're, I mean, they're, they're all here going so to early. see the home of another woman, but, right. uh, but their, their sphere, I think there's, this, um, there's a great quote from a law school student, not in the reserve, but I think it gets at this 
um, idea of the world of the woman where like um, they refer to like the house as, as being their all. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, they're isolated there. I want to get on some more questions. Yeah. Um, so Emily goes there when she stays and she stays her whole life. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how did her lens, how, how did they get observed? Yeah, so um, she, so her journal is in a, the public library for, I avoided saying it, God, I can't, it, one of the county names, which I'm going to butcher, I apologize, audiences from Ohio. Uh, so her, her diary gets preserved by her family, like, you know, we presume, and then ends up in a public collection. So there are, there's the original and like one or two transcribed copies that are in the collection of the, I think the scholar who wrote about her. So I've never seen the full journal. I've seen parts of it that have been reproduced and sort of extrapolated from that. Um, but I think because Emily's journal was so full of information about people living in that community, it was something that they thought they needed to save. And that's why it is, is preserved today. Um, did she get married? She, she did. She got married. I think she got married three times. Yes, yeah, she was married exactly. married and widowed three times and also lost a child. So she lived till 81 and a lot of the people in her life did it. So she's sort of an exceptional story in that she just- Surrounded by death. Kept, yeah, yeah, but she is literally surrounded by death. Um, so yeah, so I don't know exactly the, the path it took to get to the library. It's the chart, the chart in public library, the, that branch of the county library is where it is. Um, yeah. But it is, I would love, you know, talking about going back, I'd love to go read that. I think because it's 80 years, it would take me a week, but um, I would love to read that. Yeah, Jerry. Once they arrived, what were they eating? <laughs> um, yeah, so if you go into our exhibit, um, <laughs> so they brought, obviously, brought, they brought food out with them, and they were, we know what kind of food was going okay. out was things that could be preserved. So, you know, flour. Yeah. Um, a lot of salted pork, barrels of pork, and head cheese and things like that. Yeah. Um, but once they were out there, they were starting to farm. Um, we know they farmed, but we also know they lived. They sort of used what was available, whatever was available. So yeah, the hunting, so hunting, yep. Yeah. Um, and in the in the gallery, there's a, a little interactive that shows you all the things the surveyors who were there first, um, who ran out of supplies, um, <laughs> were eating. Some of it surprising, some of it not. Yeah. So I hear uh, it's rattlesnake, rattlesnake, skunk. Yeah. Um, Raccoon. they found like little, what they call crawfish, but like a, a type of crustacean that lived in the rivers they ate. So anything they found, they ate and they let us know yeah. whether it was good, bad, or anything by the meal. And how they prepared it. And how they prepared it. Right. So it's sort of a mix of, of everything. It's, you know, what yeah. they brought. Um, we know that there were, you know, supplies were coming in, especially once yeah. the canal opened, it was much easier to get other supplies. Hannah um, talks a lot about the, the cattle yeah. that her family has. In fact, in one case, when a calf dies, it gets multiple sentences yeah. um, in which she expresses true sadness. She lies on it, yeah. yeah. Did they establish any businesses or schools while they were there? Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's fun. Hannah, also, Hannah does talk about um, educating her children in the house, which I think is really interesting. Um, and then also sending her like which children are getting sent out for education and how she's educating the younger ones in the house um and some were sent back like yes and then some because yes. there yeah until there were schools established out there they would yeah. send their you know the wealthier families yeah. would send their yeah. children back east there's there's something that i need to look into more because at one point her daughter martha who's about 15 at the time of these letters is not in the household she's somewhere assuming being educated um and she writes often about how she wishes her husband would write the daughter more <laughs> she misses him. um yeah. and the, the interesting thing and again it's it's in part of the exhibit about education is that the uh the land company even when this constitution made they didn't really there was nothing about everyone must set up a school it was sort of like based on the people living in the town taking initiative to do so mm -hmm. so we know like emily had a, a log a log structure was built that was both a meeting house and a school and she received instruction which is probably why her diary is, is, is legible she was literate and, and was able to write it as a young girl yeah. um, but we know in other communities there, there wasn't a school or not for a long time and that's when they would to be within the family be within the family or sending you know someone to board at a different town if they had a school so it sort of was piecemeal and then eventually they got rules in place and supported education at yeah. the state and it you know, became more common yeah 
Karen, yeah. Um, so, Linda, since you mentioned that some of them were even sending people back east, do we know of any connections? You know, there's this <laughs> did you guys find any connections of the Yankees in Ohio then sending their children here to the female academy or the law school? I'm sure there were. Yeah, I'm remembering um, offhand which ones. What was was it was it Hickox or she, there was one. There was Lydia, a, Lydia Hickox. Lydia Hickox. So she was there was yeah. someone who was sent from Ohio to Mrs. Pearson School, the Fishman Game Academy, to learn how to run one. Yeah. And go back and to fly to grade yeah. one. That was equally as is good. Um so and there's Cleveland or somewhere around. Yeah. Here. And then you know, we know we we have a document where we tracked all the girls who came either from Ohio East or then left the female county went to Ohio. So there are tons of connections. Yeah. Um, I feel like all the lawyers in Ohio were from the law school. Yeah, I mean, many of them were. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know that any of them sent their sons back here. No, but we know that like the but, lawyers trained here in Litchfield sort of became the politicians and lawyers of urban Ohio um, right. in a very direct way. Swift. Yeah, Edwards. Um, there's a ton. There's yeah, a the, um, in case you're wondering, what are it was it? The Cincinnati Law School mm -hmm. that was founded by Litchfield students. Yeah, yeah so they yeah. they were all over for yeah. sure. Yeah. Your conversation was so natural. Yeah. I mean, some of I did learn things today because we, you know, we each sort of. Researched one of you know a couple of these stories again to yeah. be prepared, but we learned new things because I've learned things from Linda about things I didn't know. So, and um, that's truly how our work flow is here at me. I mean, like I like to think of it as like Linda is you're such a good digger. Like you <laughs> are so good at like digging into into the archives. I mean, I love like oftentimes I'll come back to my office and like have an email in my inbox from Linda and it's just like like we found this one there's just that about the new law student. Oh um, yeah. Where suddenly it's just an email where it's like I found this and I found this and I found this and I found this. <laughs> um and then Alex you're great at like synthesizing, right? And like that's how our exhibits get made. It's all of that digging and then it has to be synthesized and turned in, you know, and turned into exhibits. Um and that only happens through that happens through conversation, right? Let's take one more from Bill, yeah. Of all the eloquent things that all three of you said, the one that's gonna stick with me the most is about Nancy, whom history doesn't even bless with the last name. Right. And Ken, you said, what must it have been like for her? And I just thought, Wow, because of all the people, the disenfranchised people who, who don't have a known recorded role in history, and and it, I'll just I'll just never think she started out on the right? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just never drive through the streets of this town again without thinking of all the people who who, who don't end up with monuments or journals or diaries, mm -hmm. but who had to make the best of life. Um, with her 16 month old. Yeah. <laughs> Can you keep saying that? Three mile hike. That's, she, she, Let alone she's, 400, right? And, and we don't we don't know anything about her, but but she's she's I guess she stands for me for all the other people then and now who are caught up in these huge moves taken for whatever reason. Um, yeah. Migration is taken for whatever reason. Thanks. Yeah. And it's just, I, I just think it's so wonderful that you included her and you weren't doing it to be politically correct. It's just, she spoke to you um, in addition, as well as the ones like Hannah, who, about whom we know so much more. So that's just such good historianship. What do you, what do you call what you guys do? I'm not, a, I'm, we're not, just, I don't know. Yeah, I don't call it. We're, we're, it's good curiosity. Yeah, well, 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 it's, it's curiosity. I mean, mm -hmm. um, the important thing about today is that if you go get any book about the Western Reserve from the 20th century and you open it up, it's going to be like Royal Charter, Connecticut politicians, people who bought lands, people whose towns were named after, people who started businesses. It's all, it's all men. Yeah. The, the history of this story is largely told through men historically. Like historically. Yeah. Um, and we knew that our story couldn't shouldn't be the same and needed to be yeah. 
about everyone, and, and I will, I'll be dead honest, I love surveying more than anyone, but I would rather read Hannah's letters than a surveyor's journal any day of the week, because the women left the best, the most useful records for us about what life was like and what life was really like for everyone. Yeah. And Hannah is just so, I, I'll just put a plug in for Hannah. She's so, like, I, I read her letters and I, and you feel that emotion and it's so relatable. But one thing about Nancy that I think you bring up is that um, in doing a lot of this research, it's sometimes the questions that we're left with that are really the most interesting, right? Also the hardest to put on a wall. And then it's the hardest ones, what do you put, put there? On you don't have anything. You right. don't have an artifact, you don't have a document. Right. Like, how do you display that? Really hard to do. So you have a conversation about it. Right. <laughs> yeah. I just want to thank your Nancy's comment. This has been an amazing format. It really brought history into a, an interpretation. And listening to the, the mechanics of the way you develop history is really interesting, too. So I, I encourage you to do more of this. This is very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.